So, um, we're using the myth of freedom to provide structure, uh, and we're recommending that you read along. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I edited that book, and I, I say this in all humility. I mean, I read it, the chapter, in preparation for this talk. I felt like I'd never seen it before. Um, every time I read it, it uh, which is not all that often but over the years, but it's, uh, it's so profound, you know, what, what he was teaching. It's really beautiful. I, I think it's worth, re worth your time to read it. The uh, topic that tonight was chapter two, <clears throat> entitled, <laughs> as only he could, The Cosmic Joke, <clears throat> Trimble Ribicek. Can you help me tighten this? I'm sorry, Tim. It just keeps falling down and I can't get it tighter from where I sit. <clears throat> Great, thanks. And um, the topic, that is referred to by the cosmic joke is our confusion and suffering. <laughs> it's kind of funny, don't you think? Um, and really what he's talking about is uh, the structure of the belief in a self and how it works, how it arises and what shape it takes, <clears throat> what, what the form of it is. And the reason that um, we're studying this at all, you know, this, uh, the basic structure of our confusion, our suffering, our error, as it were, and in fact it's called error. Uh, there's a word trulpa in Tibetan, means error, which refers to the sort of the funda fundamental, most fundamental aspect of this mistake, which becomes elaborated. But the reason we're, we're uh, studying it at all is because unless we recognize it, see it, understand it, then we're doomed to repeat it. I keep thinking Santayana, the famous philosopher, said you know, about that of history, that those who do not uh, know history are doomed to repeat it. Well, those who do not understand the mistakes that they are making, these, the, the fundamental error, are doomed to repeat it over and over again. It's kind of like, unless you are aware that you're dreaming, and what the dream is, you might think it's real and live your life as though the dream were real. And that's why we study this, to begin to understand that things that, so there are things that we take for granted that we think are real, which are just a dream, which are a mistake, which are a fiction. Um, He starts by saying that uh, we all have a un fundamental uncertainty about our existence. We feel that our existence is um, at risk, that we, our well-being, which is just another way of saying our existence, um, is fundamentally questionable and risky. And that feeling of uncertainty produces fear uh, in us, a kind of low-grade mostly anxiety, but sometimes reaching high-grade and intense proportions. And that anxiety drives our days and informs a lot of the things and decisions and thoughts and actions that we live and take. And it produces an attempt on our part to constantly reinforce and confirm the solidity of our existence in one way or another. And we all have different ways of doing this. It might be by trying to be successful in our careers. It might be by wanting to be acknowledged and loved. Um, it might be um, by being creative and surrounding ourselves with the works of our cre creativity, our creation which act as mirrors. There are all kinds of things that we can do. We can sit down and make a catalog of the way, ways in which we attempt to solidify and to prove to ourselves that our existence is solid and ongoing. 
But in point of fact, our very existence is not solid and ongoing. It's open space. It's happening right now. This whole room that we're sitting in now, as you turn your head, everything changes. It's a constant flux. It's an arising. Here's the red and the whatever it is, plaid sort of, of your coat. And, and here is the, the gray of your coat and the pink of your head. And, <laughs> and, and, it just, and the blue of the cushion and the sound of the voice. And it's all arising and passing away. Nothing is solid. You can't grasp it even for a second. And yet we try to make it solid. You know, we say, there's Sarah. There's the Zabutan. Here am I in relationship to it. And we're constantly, throughout our days, defining ourselves in relationship to all the things around us as though those things had, a, had a, some kind of static existence, some kind of solid, true existence, which implies that I have a solid, solid true existence. But that nothing does. Everything is in a, it's like we're sitting in the middle of a, of a swirling soup of, of phenomena arising and passing away, arising out of nothing and passing away back into it, just like these words. He calls it a hoax and that it's actually open space that we are living in. We set up a back and forth between an appearing and a disappearing other. And we develop a complex structure built on the attempt to solidify what is constantly dissolving, the sense of I and other. What we do is we, we build up a story that we tell ourselves. And this story has a particular structure to it. And it's the story of me and mine, me and everything that relates to me. It's an ongoing story. This story um, is described in traditional terms as the, the structure of ego, of the self, in, as being in, occurring in five steps or stages. These are called the five skandhas. <clears throat> now the version that um, Trungpa Rinpoche gives in the Myth of Freedom is a much later version than you will find if you study, for instance, the Theravada teachings. Um, and it's a very dynamic version. Uh, and that's what I'm going to go through tonight. So the first skanda the first heap, the first sort of development of ego, and this actually is where the fundamental error takes place, this trulpa, this um, uh, error. Sometimes it's translated as delusion, but I think error is a better translation because error happens from time to time, and it happens again and again. It's not something that is monolithic and ongoing. And the error is this, that in the middle of all this open space, that we sit in, full of flashing colors, the arising, you know, of, of uh, you know, the black of one one's hair and the blue of the cushion and the sound of my voice and the feeling of your bottom on the cushion, all of these things flashing in the open space and passing away. Then in the midst of all that, something appears. It's like I say, ah, there's Christina. And suddenly, against this ground of space and phenomena arising, there is a figure, the figure that I have chosen to select, that I have focused on, Sasha, the Zabutan, the cup. And that everything else recedes into ground, and that figure stands out as something that has true existence and significance and importance. That is the fundamental error, right there. Because as soon as something seems to exist or to be out there, it implies the existence of a perceiver here, I. So there's kind of a journey that takes place from that to this. Oh, that's there, therefore I am here looking at it. That sound occurred over there, therefore I am here listening to it. 
And this is the fundamental, this is the birth of ego. It's called form because it's the birth of something existing. And it happens from moment to moment, from time to time. It's an illusion. And the illusion is that because I see a figure against the ground, what's your name? I'm sorry. Uh, Ariel. Because I'm, I'm focusing on Ariel, everything else fades into relative insignificance or in unimportance behind him. You know, just like you draw a line on a piece of paper. I once watched Trungpa Rinpoche teach something, this teaching, only much more complex, and he went to the blackboard and he drew a stick figure of a bird on the blackboard. And he said to these sleepy University of Colorado students that he was teaching back in 1971, he said, uh, what's this a picture of? And finally some kid said, it's a picture of a bird. And Trungpa Rinpoche said, it's a picture of the sky. It's, it's like this is the, the awareness that we can have. We can have this open awareness of the field in which all of these things are arising and passing away. But we don't do that. We say, oh, there's Sarah, and I want to have, there's me here, and I want to have a relationship with Sarah. Do I like Sarah? Yes, I like her. Maybe we can have a relationship. And we get it, go into a whole story with plans and future intentions and judgments and imagina imaginings. And this is the way we do all the time. This is the birth of form, of the idea of existence. And the problem is that since nothing really does exist, everything is a constant arising and passing away, the whole thing is fraught with anxiety because it's not true. It's a lie that we're trying to make true. Me and my existence, the existence of, if, if, if she exists there, I exist here. That's the logic. If I see that there, then I see it. I, I am here, the perceiver. And the interesting thing is that when you go to find that perceiver, which is one of the inquiries that you do um, sometimes in Buddhist practice, it's a very early beginning one, and you try and find I. And as soon as you find the perceiver, the, that I, the perceiver, there's a perceiver who's perceiving the perceiver. It's like trying to find the center of a circle. You find the center, but it has a center. And you find that center, and it has a center. And you find the perceiver, and who's perceiving? There's always someone else back there. You can never find it, because it's imaginary. It's imputed, but it doesn't actually exist. He says, we ignore the open, fluid, intelligent quality of space. And it is underlain with the suspicion that there is no real solid me, which scares me. And how many times, you know, that this anxiety arises in so many ways. The anxiety about my well-being, about my career, about my loneliness, about my... Um, meaningfulness of my life, all kinds of things. And it's this abstract paranoia, that anxiety, that drives our karma, which enslaves us. It drives all the stories that we wind up telling about ourselves and the world, which enslave us. And we become dream walkers, living out dreams that are driven by this fundamental underlying anxiety that I don't exist. And the fact is, I don't. <laughs> so it's endless, you know, trying to solidify that because you can't. This is why some, they say samsara, samsara is the word for confusion, suffering, is endless. It's endless because we are constantly, what samsara is, is the constant repetitive attempt to solidify me and my well-being, me and my existence, to undo the anxiety that I don't actually exist. And the fact is, I don't. And so you can't get, get rid of it. And that anxiety is, constantly arises again and again. Every time you say, that's there, therefore I am here. It's in that motion 
from that to this, that the anxiety lives. Because in that motion, it's going to die. It's going to stop. It's a motion. It's like a gesture of a hand. It has a beginning and an end. And, in, and we don't want it to end. You know, this, it has that built in, the fear of its own death. And so that gives birth to the second skanda, the second of the five skandhas. It's like, if that's there, then I'm here. Now, how do I keep this thing alive? Well, the way I keep it alive is I reach out and I feel the quality of that other. That, is that other friendly? Is it for me? Is it neutral? Or is it an enemy? Is it something that's going to threaten my existence? Those are the three possibilities, the three kinds of feeling. There's no fourth. Is it for me, against me, or neutral, indifferent? That's the second skanda. It's called feeling, Vedana in Sanskrit. So that appears out there, and immediately it's like you're walking down the street and you see somebody, and you immediately start thinking, do I like this person? It's a complete stranger, right? And you have feelings about whether or not you like them based on their looks. Everybody, I'll bet you anything that in this room, subliminally, we've all looked at each other and had feelings about whether or not we liked each other, you know, like the looks of this person. You know, beginning ones. You can overcome them, you can wind up disliking somebody you thought you were like and vice versa. But we all do that all the time. And that's that second skanda. It's like the first, something's there, how do I feel about it? And you see, it's keeping the game alive, the back and forth. So then the third skanda is having had a feeling. The third skanda um, is you label it. It's called concept. And more than label it, you actually do something. You put some energy into that. You label it good, bad, or indifferent. You label it that way. And then you give a push or a pull. Or you walk away because you don't care. You actually do something. It's, it's an impulse. It's, there's an energetic quality to it. If that thing is friendly, you want to pull it towards you. If it's dangerous, you want to push it away from you if you don't like it, if it's unattractive. And if it's neutral, you don't care. You just sort of ignore it. These are the th called the three poisons. And perhaps you've seen the wheel of life. You know, the, it's called the bhava chakra. And this demon is holding it in his arms, and he's got fangs. He's biting the top of it and holding the bottom of it with his arms. You know, he's a real demon. A uh, demon is Yama. He's the lord of death. And the wheel of life at the very center, uh, it's got a coil of joy. But around that, uh, there are a chicken, a pig, and a snake. And uh, they represent the three poisons uh, passion, pulling it towards me aggression, pushing it away, and it's usually translated badly as ignorance, the third one, and that's a bad translation for it. Uh, it there's a, ignorance is better used for, to translate another term, uh, avidya, not knowing. Um, th this word is moha, and the better translation for it would be indifference. Or there's another word that he uses, um, yeah, you know, he uses indifference. He says of indifference that we feel numb and insensitive to this other. With passion, we want to grasp things. We want to eat them up. And aggression is based, this is interesting, he said that aggression is based on a feeling of poverty, um, that we are speeding about, running faster and faster in order to find a way to feed or defend ourselves. We're using uh, what's out there. The fourth skanda is called samskara, which is usually translated as uh, um, karmic patterns. Uh, he chose to translate it, Trungpa Rinpoche, as intellect. Because it's the idea that, okay, well now we've got concepts, very primitive concepts in the third skanda. Actually, um, infants, when they're first born, and they start just or starting to identify things you can see it, and the first thing the baby learns is, you know, mama, dada, milk, you know. 
things like that. They learn these very basic words. And what they're doing is they're beginning to develop. That's the, they're, they're operating at the level of the third skanda. They've got the push-pull you know, of pleasure-pain. It's very instinctive. It's uh, you know, automatic. And they are beginning to develop words, concepts. And when they begin to put these words into stories, that's the fourth skanda. So, for instance, you watch a toddler, and one of the first things you might teach a, a toddler is, the stove is hot. Don't touch the stove. And I remember watching my daughter, daughter look, at, <clears throat> look at the stove and point to it and say, hot, hot. You know, she's beginning to con construct a story about a hot stove that can burn you <clears throat> and cause you pain, which is what the fourth skan is all about. And we begin to develop very complex stories this is the stuff of karma, because we repeat these stories to us ourselves over and over again, and they always have to do with self-aggrandizement, self-protection, or indifference, the three poisons. And we live these stories over and over again, and sometimes they're inappropriate. That's the problem with concept and stories. So for instance, the stove isn't always hot. Sometimes it's cold. It's okay to touch it, you know, as an example. So that's the fourth skanda. And then things really start to get mixed up. Um, the energy of the third skanda, the push-pull, the three poisons, you know, pushing things away, pulling them towards you, um, walking away from them, gets mixed up with the stories and we move then into the final and fifth skanda, which is called consciousness, vijnana in Sanskrit. And in consciousness what happens is we get full-blown stories that we tell ourselves that are f full of energy, the energy of the third skanda mixed with the concept of the fourth skanda. It's like you take um, a typescript and you add paint you know, and suddenly you've got color and it comes alive as a full-blown movie full of emotion and thrills and chills and love and hate. And that's what the fifth skanda is. It's all these stories that are full of energy and emotion. Only they get very, very confused and mixed up. It's like everything gets jumbled. And so, you know, you... You, ha you tell yourself a story about this person who insulted you and how um, they never should have said that to me and I'm going to get even and I'm really angry at this person and you can feel the anger boiling in you and you want to punch them in the nose or you know, either literally or figuratively in your imagination. And you have this story going on in your mind and it might actually propel you into action. You might actually punch that person in the nose or do something mean you know, to them the next time you have the opportunity and you, it, it takes you into action. These stories that we tell ourselves. This is the fundamental problem of ego, of confusion, of samsara. And it's all based on this fundamental mistake. The mistake that I and other actually have some real existence when in fact they don't at all. Now, then what happens is that these stories in the fifth skanda become very elaborate and they tend to fall into one of a number of patterns and these are called uh, the realms, the six realms, although actually they're organized e even more than that. Um, they're organized into uh, what are called the three worlds or the three uh, datus. Uh, datu is a, it means sort of space, uh, area. And these are all samsaric, all three of them. And what they are is, I'll just tell you their names, there's the datu or the, um, the space of, of pure uh, of formlessness, there's the space of pure form, and then there's the space of desire. This is the rupa datu, the arupa datu, the rupa datu, and the kama datu. Kama means desire. You know, you've all heard of Kama Sutra, you know, the, the teaching about uh, sex and all that and desire. And so the, the two, the first two, the formless realm, 
and the realm of pure form are what you might call meditative states. They are only achieved through acts of extraordinary concentration. They have to do with, with um, training the mind one-pointedly upon an object and achieving a kind of calm which can be very, very pleasant. In fact, it can be even blissful. And the object that one takes um, as one moves up through the realm of pure form and then the realm of formlessness becomes more and more subtle. You might focus on an object like initially the breath or a candle flame or you know, a, a mantra. By the time you get into the formless realms, you're focusing on things like pure consciousness, space, not this and not that. You know, it gets sub very, very subtle. And when you get up to those levels, which is very difficult to do, it takes tremendous amount of effort, um, it's very pleasant and it's very blissful. And it's a cul-de-sac. You can stay there for long periods of time, but it's still within samsara. It's something that is created. It's based on me, my desire to achieve some kind of pleasure, to achieve altogether. And so it's what we in this tradition call spiritually materialistic. You're using spiritual techniques for materialistic self-serving ends. And it's temporary, it's pointless, um, and ultimately it's dangerous. Now, um, more interesting to us, being ordinary, more ordinary mortals, we haven't practiced these kinds of concentration states. They're actually called the dhyanas. Dhyana is a word, uh, Sanskrit word, that is usually translated as meditation. But uh, the, here it, it refers to these concentration states. But for us ordinary mortals, we, we live within the realm of desire. And that is subdivided into six realms. And uh, these are uh, the God realm, the um, jealous God realm, the realm of the Asuras, Devas, Asuras, the human realm, and we're obviously all of us living in the human realm, um, the animal realm, the realm of the hungry ghosts, and the hell realm. Now there are three ways to take the realms. One is uh, that you're actually born into them. So, obviously, we're born into the human realm. And if anybody in this room has a pet, a cat or a dog or a goldfish, they have a friend in the animal realm. And what the teachings say is that there are four other realms that are not available to the perception of most human beings. And those are the god realms, the jealous god realms, the hungry ghost realms, and the hell realms. And you can be born into those when you die which is not a great thing. The best realm to be born into is the human realm because it's the only realm from which you can actually tread the path to freedom from confusion, to enlightenment, if you want to call it that, to awakening is a better word for it. Now that's one way to take the realms. But <clears throat> the second way, which is actually perhaps more useful for our purposes, is that even though each one of us is in the body of a human being, we can have the mentality of any of these realms. And we will tend to have a mentality of one of them and keep it for a long time, maybe even our whole lifetime. It can change, but it tends to endure for a long time. So you can be in the body of a human being, but have the mentality of a god. And we can discuss what that is or have the mentality of a hell being. And you can see hell beings. You've seen them occasionally on the streets of New York, you know, ranting and raving and talking to themselves and looking really crazy, out of touch with reality. And then the third way to take these realms is that you can be in the body of a human being and have the mentality of whatever, a god. But you can experience all of the realms in a flash, just for a moment. You might get angry, and in that moment of anger, you experience the hell realm. 
that feeling of molten lava pouring down your throat, you know? Who was it they say that um, revenge is a poison? Who was telling me this? Revenge is a poison you drink. Um, uh, is a poison you drink yourself hoping that it will kill your enemy. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you feel it, that heat of fury, of anger. They, they liken it to drinking molten metal. And we can all experience the realms in a moment, in a flash. Um, you can experience, you can be a human, have the mentality of a human being, but in a moment you might experience somebody gives you a huge amount of money and you just are blissful. And you think, I've got it made, you know? I just won the jackpot. You know, I've got it made. That's the mentality of God. That's what, that almost defines godhood. Gods think they've got it made. Everything, you know, their, their lives are perfect. I don't have to worry anymore. Everything's great, you know? And it's going to stay great for a long, long time, maybe forever. You know, I'll never be poor again. I'll always be rich and famous and loved. And I'm just, I've got it made. I'm so happy, you know, and I'm a god. They say of gods, everything they see is beautiful, everything they hear is music, everything they smell is perfume, and uh, everything they taste is ambrosia. So you can be born as a human being, have the mentality of a god, and experience the hell realm in, in a flash, and then it passes. So these are the three ways to take the realms. Let's talk about um, the realms finally because the thing is, you see, as long as we are devolving into dreams, and I challenge you, I challenge you, watch your mind for even five minutes and watch how many times we slip away into dream. We lose track of the present. We lose track of knowing that we're dreaming. We don't even know we're dreaming. And then suddenly you realize you're dreaming. Oh, I did it again. You know? We do it so often. And when we fall into these dreams, um, they take one or more of these forms. Sometimes they can combine realms. So the God realm we've discussed is blissful, it's pleasurable. The problem with it is it's actually temporary. And um, when a god begins to realize that they could lose their physical beauty or that their money has diminished, they're not as rich as they thought they were, or that their health is going, you know, that uh, they're suffering uh, loss of body function as they age, then the feeling of disappointment and of uh, anger and of betrayal and of having wasted you know, their time, having been tricked almost you know, by, by themselves or by someone else, can make them just furious and miserable. They say that when a god begins to fall, you know, like, <laughs> you want to see gods falling, go to Aspen. Um, I haven't been there in a long time, but I used to do a lot of business up in Aspen. A cult of youth. People want to stay young. Everybody's getting a tan. Everybody's, you know, watching their weight. Everybody's looking great, you know. <clears throat> Nobody wants to get old and die, and everybody is getting old and dying. <laughs> you know, except for the young ones who are the new ones who are coming. Constant replenishment. It's a real God realm. And when the people begin to, when the gods begin to fall, the other gods begin to shun them. They don't want to know them. It's like, ew, you know, because it sends a message, you know, that it could happen to you. So they uh, shun the, that falling god. And they say that the disappointment can be so great that the god is plunged into the hell realm. Um, <clears throat> Jealous gods are interesting. These are warriors. And um, in the iconography, you see the gods inhabiting heaven. And heaven is walled. And 
the jealous gods are outside the walls and they want to get in. They want to get to heaven. So they're storming in the gates. They're sieging heaven, you know, like the siege of Troy. And they're warriors. And they're very smart, uh, the Asuras, the jealous gods. Um, they are very comparative. They're constantly comparing their own well-being. Here, I'm going to read some notes. Uh, it's very intelligent, and they're very speedy. Um, they're constantly trying to attain something higher or greater, preoccupied with comparison, and a jealous God regards their life situations as games in the sense uh, that there is an opponent and, uh, and, and yourself, that you and you, you're constantly in a, uh, in a situation where you're competing with an opponent in one game after the next. I think, um, you know, I think of, when I think of people who are jealous gods, I think of people who are climbing corporate ladders, uh, Wall Street types wanting to be rich, um, people who are very, very competitive uh, are jealous gods, and they're smart, really smart, can be, mostly. The human realm, this is an, the really interesting one, because this is the one that um, we're born into, and I think that probably most of the people in the room never know, but my suspicion is that are, are humans. Um, the human realm embodies an intelligent kind of grasping in which the logical reasoning mind is always geared toward the creation of happiness. We're always trying to figure out what will make me happy. What restaurant can I go to tonight that's going to really have a terrific meal that will make me happy? You know, you know who can I go to? What's, what Broadway show you know, is going to really flip me out? I don't want to go to one where I'm sitting there thinking, oh, I wish I hadn't wasted the money. You know, I want to go to a Broadway show that's going to be thrilling. The magnetizing is more selective and intelligent than the Asura realm. It's the, the human realm is the realm of connoisseurs. You know, you're really sort of finely appraising the, your, your pleasure. A high degree of selectivity and fussiness. You have your own ideology and your own style. And here he says, this is a quote, the essence of the human realm is the endeavor to achieve some high ideal. That's a beaut. Like, do good, be compassionate, you know, save the environment. Um, what high ideal do you want to espouse? You would like to be a great personage. There is an heroic attitude, an attempt to create monuments, the human realm. Why are you shaking your head? What's the other book? Ernst Becker? And he's saying the same kind of thing? Yeah. There's a strong emphasis on education in the human realm. Does this all sound familiar? Knowledge, learning. And here is the epitome of the human realm is to be stuck in a huge traffic jam of discursive thought. Duh. <laughs> it's like, here we are. And there's a quote that I liked. He, he sums up all, all the realms here. He says, in the God realm, you are completely absorbed in a blissful state, a kind of self-stuck sense of satisfaction. In the jealous God realm, you are completely drunk on competitiveness. There is less possibility of thought happening because your experiences are so strong that they overpower you, hypnotize you. In the case of the human realm, there are more thoughts happening. The intellectual or logical mind becomes much more powerful so that one is completely overwhelmed by the possibility of magnetizing new situations. You want to create all kinds of great stuff and pull it to you. So it is very intellectual, busy, disturbing, the human realm. Sound familiar? This is where we live? <laughs> now, um, below that are the lower realms, and these are the realms that you don't want to inhabit. 
uh, in any way, if possible. We, we inhabit them in flashes, uh, but they're bad places to be because uh, they're very far remo removed from the Dharma. The upper, of the upper realms, really the only one that you can practice the Dharma in fully is the human realm. But at least the gods appreciated the Dharma. You know, they were always up there throwing flowers down on the Buddha and saying things like, uh, well, I don't know what he's saying exactly, but I think he's a great guy and here's some more flowers, you know. <laughs> they're, they're sort of like dumb jocks, you know, the gods. It's sort of the Marie Antoinette, uh, let them eat cake mentality. You can't really um, understand suffering. And the Asuras, they understand it all right, but uh, you know, they're really busy being competitive. But in the, hum in the animal realm and in the low three lower realms, there's no practice of the Dharma going on. There's no time. There's much too much suffering. The suffering gets more and more intense as you go down into the lower realms, lower and lower. So the animal realm is the realm of stupidity. That's what characterizes animals. It's kind of the, the symbol of the animal realm is a pig which just eats whatever is in front of its nose. It's not selective. You know, it's, most animals are that way. They, they barely make any, and there's certainly no connoisseurship among animals. You know, it's, think of your dog. Um, and, uh, and they have a very limited range of responsiveness to the external environment. We, as humans, have an extraordinary range of, of, subtle, of subtle responsiveness. But think about your dog. You know, it's got a very limited range. What does he do? Pee on it, you know, lick it, bite it, wag its tail at it, bark at it, jump on it. Have I exhausted the range of possibilities? Uh, <laughs> close. And that's the stupidity of the animal realm, the lack of responsiveness. The, it's sort of that plowing ahead and just doing whatever is right in front of its nose. It's very stuck in a series of repetitive, habitual responses to all different kinds of, of stimuli. And for most animals, their lives are dominated by fear of survival. But then you could say that of, of human beings too. It really dominates us as well, that low-grade, sometimes high-grade anxiety. But in animals, it's much more apparent and much more to the point because most animals are in danger of losing their lives one way or the other. If they're, you know, meat, uh, they're going to be slaughtered. If they're wild, they're, uh, uh, they, they're potential prey. So the animal life is not a great life. It's stupid. It's uh, repetitive. It's, uh, you, you, they can't tread the path, they can't tread the path to awakening, awakening from their dreams. They have very little, if any, self-consciousness. So they can't really become aware of the extent to which they're dreaming. They can't make that kind of discrimination that a human being can make. Below that is the realm of the, uh, the pretas, the jealous, I mean, the, the, excuse me, the hungry ghosts. And these are beings that are driven by hunger they feel that they are fundamentally deprived. The classic depiction of a hungry ghost, and there are many hungry ghosts, by the way, many different styles of hungry ghost. Um, some of them are celestial musicians, by the way. They're called Gandharvas. But the classic hungry ghost has an enormous belly, a tiny neck, and a tiny mouth. And the only sustenance they can take is a single grain of rice or a single drop of liquid. And they, because their mouth is so small and their neck is so tiny, and yet they have this enormous belly to fill. And so they're driven by hunger. I knew a guy in school who I look back and I, I feel was something of a hungry ghost. He was always, always, um, he was the classic sycophant. You know, the person who always wanted to be liked by other people, and everybody knew it because he was so obvious about it. His neediness, uh, his hunger uh, to be liked, and it made people just barely tolerate him. Um, and they, they would be friendly and kind to him, but uh, everybody was slightly repulsed by the neediness and the lack of direct contact. 
the hungry ghost is very, very um, uh, unhappy being because it's driven by an endless hunger. They say of hungry ghosts that they actually are here in the room with us right now. They're up there in the corners of the ceiling as oblivious of us down here as we are of them. <laughs> they live in the little worlds up there in the corners, some classes of hungry ghosts. Finally, there are the hell beings. <clears throat> and the hell beings are driven by aggression. Each one of these realms has its emotion. I should have said that. The emotion of the god realm is pride. The emotion of the jealous god realm is jealousy, you know, comparativeness, competitiveness. The emotion of the human realm is passion, you know, wanting to be constantly scheming to be, you know, how, how, how to be happy. What movie are we going to go to tonight? You know, which restaurant? Uh, which wine should I buy? <laughs> you know, it could be onophiles. Which opera should I go and hear? <laughs> um, and then the uh, human, the animal realm is dr driven by stupidity. The hungry ghost realm by hunger, by poverty, a sense of poverty mentality, extreme poverty. And the hell realm is driven by hatred hatred and aggression, because hell beings see enemies everywhere. Their very existence is constantly and immediately threatened. And the environment is terribly dangerous and frightening. And as a result, it's very hot. It's full of uh, claustrophobic energy. And it's the claustrophobia of extreme heat, like you're in a furnace. And the hells, there are 16 fundamental hells, eight cold, because cold is very painful too, and eight hot. And then there are a bunch of peripheral hells as well. You can, there's a terrific book, um, which I recommend guardedly, because some people don't like it. Uh, it's sort of fundamentalist Buddhism, but it's gorgeous. It's very, one of the great Buddhist books by a man named Patrul Rinpoche called The Words of My Perfect Teacher, right? And in it, he describes all this very, very, very colorfully, these realms, with lots of great stories um, to illustrate the, the, what the realms are like. And he describes the hell realms in detail. Um, you know, the different tortures that you experience, you know, the hell realm of molten metal where beings are constantly disappearing into the molten metal, they're being burned alive, and then they're being reborn and only to do it again and again and again. <laughs> it's really terrible. But this is the realm of aggression and hatred where you see enemies and you feel hatred and aggression and it's hot, it's burning inside. We all know this. We've all experienced this in the course of our daily lives. And perhaps we've known people uh, who've lived in hell realms. You know, the people who are living in the hell realms, human beings who are, have the mentality of hell beings, used to be institutionalized. Um, and now a lot of them are out on the streets because uh, we can't afford to institutionalize them anymore. These are the people who were put on Thorazine and other heavy psychotropic drugs. Uh, to keep them calm. So the main point about all these realms is that each one of us is telling ourselves stories about our lives which are, on the whole, characteristic of probably one of these realms. The dominant one is probably the human realm. That is the, that's the stories of passion, of pleasure, of connoisseurship, of... Uh, of scheming and thinking a lot about how to get happy. But it might be the other realms, you know, and it's very good to become aware of what one's dreams are because until you do that, you don't have any opportunity to wake up. You think it's real. One does. One thinks that these, what one's thinking about one's life is true when in fact it's just the stuff of one of these realms. It's a fiction because, and when you strip it away, 
that fiction. What's left is this open space full of flashing colors and shapes and sounds. All the objects of the five senses plus the objects of the mind which arise in the moment and pass away in the moment so vividly and colorfully but which we don't notice when we're lost in the stories that we tell ourselves. And those stories are painful. They're fraught with anxiety. They keep us moving in a forward lean to try and mitigate that, that anxiety, that fear for our well-being, our existence. Trumbo Rinpoche called that, that forward lean, he called it uh, neurotic speed. That you, It's like you're on a treadmill and you can't stop your feet from moving because you might fall down, you feel, if you do. So the only way to really begin um, is you practice meditation, which is the practice of coming present. That's the practice of waking up. But you also begin to take a look at the thoughts that have arisen in your mind and notice, what's my patterning? What are the dreams that I'm, I'm getting sucked into again and again? Because that way you can begin to pry yourself loose from them, one can. One can begin to wake up from them. Now, when you get rid of the thing about these dreams is that pernicious as they are, <clears throat> They locate us. They give us reference points about who I am and where I'm going and where I've been and what's meaningful to me and all kinds of reference points, which is very, sort of feels, gives you some kind of perverse security. It's not a very nice security, but it is some security. And the, really, really what this path is about is about giving up all reference points and beginning to dwell in this centerless space full of flashing phenomena. And this is described very much, uh, this living in reality, is described in the, especially in the Vajrayana teachings, the tantric teachings, which is really what they're all about. That's why the tantric and the Tibetan stuff is so extraordinarily colorful. You look at Tara up there on the wall, behind you. You know, she's a peaceful one. And then there are the wrathful ones. Do we have any? I don't think we do in this room. Any wrathful deities. Um, and all the color of the uh, Vajrayana is because this world emerges when it's stripped of the dreams as very vivid and colorful and meaningful in a different way. Meaningful not in the sense of taking us forward to mitigate our anxiety and to fulfill our dreams, but colorful and meaningful in its own right, for no reason at all, without purpose. So this has been a discussion or a teaching about what's wrong. And uh, a lot of the Buddhist teachings have to do with what's right, because they want to sort of key our intelligence. They want to stimulate us into seeing that enlightened world, you might say, that awakened world. It's called sacred world. Uh, because when you see sacred world, in order to see it, you have to stop dreaming. You step out of the dreams, the dreams of I and other. So there are kind of two ways to come at it. One is you can attack the mistake of I and other and try and get rid of it and then see what's revealed. And the other is you can try and see what all these enlightened people have seen and in doing that, you have to step out of that fog of, of dream, of the realms. It's worth really reading that chapter. I, he does an amazing job of describing the realms, I think. Um, I'm sure there, there's more and there's better, but it's pretty darn good. <laughs> I love what he said about the human realm. I mean, I... I, I I sat there and I, I just said, yeah, that's me, that's me. <laughs> you know, intellect, uh-huh, you know, you know, connoisseurship, you know, wanting to appreciate, you know, the fine pleasures of life. Yeah, I can, I can drink to that. <laughs> I'm sure everybody here could. So I'm going to stop and we could have a discussion if you like. And pass, we'll pass a mic. Thank you.
what you said about um, establish ourselves as a fixed entity and so this idea of beings in the human realm wanting to establish a reputation or giving money to a theater to get their name on it and so this idea of establishing a, a solid self that I can refer to and if anyone else has any questions I can refer them to it as well I think that's a really interesting idea refer, refer, refer them to what well I'm David Koch there's the David Koch theater it's right there. Can't you see it? It's very solid. It's got my name on it, for example. So not only do I reassure myself by standing out on Lincoln Center Plaza and looking at the beautiful letters on the front of the building, yeah. but I'm able to refer the less aware <laughs> of me yeah. to my building. Yeah. It's very interesting. There's a wonderful poem by uh, Shelley uh, called Ozymandias. Anybody know that poem? I can see Christina does. Um, and uh, I can't quote it, but I, the general gist of it is that a traveler is traveling in Central Asia in the middle of a barren waste. And he comes across a head, a giant head, sticking out of the sand. And uh, in the middle of nowhere. And he brushes away some of the sand and he finds an inscription at the base of the head and it says here lies Ozymandias king of kings tremble all ye mortals who pass by <laughs> and the wind is blowing and howling and the sand is and there's nothing out there <laughs> you know David Koch theater absolutely <laughs> um, the other thing that struck me was when you were talking about the animal realm yeah. um, I've I've met and interacted with pets that I'm convinced are smarter than I am. So it's not a simple matter of stupidity, but I wonder about maybe reactivity. So like a smart dog will recognize its owner and respond with affection. That's that's some thoughtfulness. But and maybe the animals lack imagination. They're not building architectural monuments. They're not painting pictures. Their, their life is simple, right? When's my next meal? When do I get a nap? Where's my owner? There's no, right? question. no question. Some animals, some species are smarter than other species, obviously. And within the species, some individuals are smarter than other individuals. So, I mean, over, over the years, I've often met dogs that I think, you know, maybe in, maybe in his next life, you know, her next life, you know, she'll be a human, you know, or move up the chain. Point being that when, I'm, when I feel myself acting in that way, like just by conditioned behavior and not being very thoughtful of others or myself or the consequences of my actions. Um, certainly that's a stupid thing to do, but that's my imagination of myself in the animal realm, where I'm just, just, as you say, eating whatever's in front of me, or just sort of plowing along thoughtlessly. There are two keys to dealing with the realms. One is clear seeing, clearing away the dreams, coming present, seeing things stripped of the judgments of good and bad. You know, actually seeing things without, or, or that's maybe going too far. To simply see that we are making judgments of good and bad, of, you know, that we're th nice and not nice or whatever. As long as we can begin to become awake to the way our mind is discriminating and laying concepts on the world. That's a huge first step. And the second aspect, so the first step is, is really, or one step is clarity. And the other is compassion. Compassion clears the air enormously. It's what, uh, without that, the path is not possible. There has to be empathy. There has to be heart and compassion in this. It, it, because it makes the, the air clear. It makes the dreams dissolve. 
it, it, it makes the world light up, you know, and the real world, the world of the present moment. So those are the two techniques that we practice. And you're, you're, you were basically saying something very similar to it when you talked about how you felt about those animals, you know. Isn't it also the case that without any compassion for ourselves, it's really Right. Definitely. And the first way to have compassion for yourself is when you're meditating, don't beat yourself up for having thoughts. Instead, take an interest in what your patterns are. Maybe you could identify your realm. Yeah, there's some batteries right there. Rochelle is going to give you two. That interest in, in your thoughts will help you be compassionate, help one's, helps one be compassionate for oneself. There's a kind of warmth in that curiosity, in that interest. But if you, if you keep saying, oh, I had a terrible meditation, I just was lost in thought, you know, that just goes on and on and on and on and it's, it makes the medita medi your, your, your meditation practice really a drag. Somebody else? Somebody says that um, um, human beings are ninety nine percent animal and one percent human, and it's that one percent human that make all the trouble. So <laughs> we're talking about ego, you know. Um, that that I think a lot of Actually, really uh, habitual, a lot of habits and a lot of ritual that runs in the background. And we can say that this pretty much around 99% of, you know, an autopilot and conditioned to do a lot of things. And only when I'm a little more awake, you know, just by that tip of the iceberg, then, you know, I'm more conscious about, you know, what I'm doing. Well, there's another saying in the that in Buddhism. They say the Dharma <coughs> is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. So any degree of waking up is good. I had um, I was very interested to hear about the hell realm because um, you know I've struggled with mental illness and. It was a very fascinating experience, well, fascinating now, um, to be going through hell in a sense. And I, I even had the copy of Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism with me, and I was reading, opening up the book and reading about paranoia as I was experiencing it. It was very odd. Um, but I, I saw everybody seem to be an enemy. Um, and I, so, I guess I, I was just, I'm very thankful that I've gotten through that. And for me, my making sense of being temporarily in the hell realm is then I'm hopefully able to be more compassionate when I see someone struggling with that. But I still, there's a part of me that's still pushing people away. And when you see someone on the street that's clearly having mental illness, it's hard. So, you know, how. That's one thing I've been struggling with lately is how do I um, be more compassionate to people in the hell realm especially? Well, I mean, there's an element of common sense uh, involved as well. Mm -hmm. You know, with some of the people you see on the street, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be safe to approach them you know, or become involved with them. Uh, in an ordinary way, just a casual way. So there's an element of common sense that you have to exercise too. Um, you know, they, otherwise you become sort of foolishly idealistic. And, uh, and that in, in itself is another form of, of egotism. You know, it's like, I want to be a good person. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get somewhere you know, with this. 
I want to make some progress. When in fact, what the, what the real thing that's demanded of us is to exercise our common sense and behave appropriately in every situation. You know, to give the situation what it needs, what it requires. Um, you know, and if somebody needs help, it might mean calling 911 or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, because if you can't handle it in a, in a realistic way. Thank you. Yeah. Just to take on to the end of that, I was also struck by something you said at that point, John, which was that we don't, we can't afford to take care of these people any longer. I would argue that the people who are in control of the budget choose not to take care of these people. And I would say that one tenth of one tenth of one tenth of a percent of the U.S. military budget would be more than we've ever spent on these people. So somebody is choosing not to take care of them, but I, do, I don't accept that we can't take care of them. I think on that we're choosing not to take care of them. That may well be. Thank you, Tim. I was just going to say that Trump Rinpoche said that we are all experiencing all the woes constantly throughout the day. So it's just not like being born into a certain room, but constantly over and over again, depending on what's going on in our life. We're going from one room to the next. And then with Patra Rinpoche's book, uh, The Age of My Perfect Teacher, um, the reason that he, did, I think, described those rooms so vividly um, is because he wanted to wake us up to the fact how important it was to practice. And so if you understand the other end of not practicing, then um, you think, well, maybe, you know, I should just think, um, maybe a little more discipline and practice meditation or whatever practice you're doing. Because the um, other side of it is very bleak. Indeed. Well said. Thank you. Um, can you recommend can any... Can you hold the mic up? Can you recommend any books or whatever uh, that pick up where you left off? On the, about the realms? No, About no, what? The, no, at the realms with the practices, and you're getting to the point of focusing awareness on awareness, and the whole. Um, <coughs> I get very exhausted with the cl clumsiness of the language. You, except there is no you. Uh, focus your awareness on awareness itself, and have some experience of being unable to in a sense, locate that awareness or the observer of the awareness itself and so on, abductio ad absurdum. Um, and so, okay, there's just awareness of phenomena. Okay, well, that's, we're not human anymore then. And it makes it kind of hard to go on with, well, what's, the, you know, what am I doing when I come out of it? Um, I haven't yet found any, I mean, maybe it's just because there's a pile of literature I haven't gotten to yet, but I haven't found anything that actually does attempt to address what, is, what does it mean to live as a human being in a human society after that point. I'm wondering if you could recommend anything in particular that does try to address that. Sure. You mean a book or two? Um, well, the book that we're basing the series of talks on, the next topic is meditation. Um, you know, chapter, this was chapter two, I think, and chapter three is titled Meditation, um, and I recommend it. Another book that talks about what the world might look like if people were awake um, there's a book called Shambhala, The Path of the Warrior. Huh? The Sacred, the Sacred Path of the Warrior. And um, Shambhala, you see, is, um, you know, perhaps you've heard the term Shangri-La, which is a cor corruption of the word Shambhala. Um, appeared in the 1939 movie, you know. Um, <laughs> and, uh, huh? 
Good movie, yeah. And uh, it's, it, what Shambhala is is a semi-mythical enlightened kingdom and where everybody was enlightened. And it's what, what does that look like? You know, how do people live? When, and the, reading that book, you know, it might help you uh, understand both what we have to overcome um, and, you know, in order to achieve that kind of awareness and um, awakening and then what it, what it looks like. And uh, the book is, is great. It's beautiful. Uh, yeah. And I, so I, those, I would recommend those two. I'd recommend those are great places to start. The Myth of Freedom and Shambhala, The Sacred Path of the Warrior. Uh, then there are lots of other things to read. I mean, it's endless. You know, I've been reading for 47 years and I'll never finish. <laughs> it's just a... You know, Slow learner, long path. <laughs> it's fun, though. You know, we we could read them together and talk about them, which is what we're encouraging people to do here. Come in and have have read the chapter in Myth of Freedom that I'm talking about, <clears throat> or that somebody's talking about, and then it just makes the discussion better. And I just I I tell you, I mean, I I started out by saying. I, I, I read Myth of Freedom again. I took notes on the chapter. <laughs> it was like and it, taking notes helps me go deeper, you know, in, in my understanding. It was really good. Uh, the stuff that he was saying, I thought that description of the human realm was so spot on and illuminating. Anyhow, so those are a couple of recommendations and I'd be happy to you know, work with you and on it and discuss it and uh, help you find a way. Yeah. Just the, the teaching style of Trungpa Rinpoche, if you're not um, aware of it, when he came, he's a, a Tibetan teacher, and when he came to the States, um, his teaching style was very different than other teachers because he... Um, got to know his Western students and um, geared it towards their understanding, Western understa with the Western mind, and taught in English, which was very radical at that time for Tibetan teachers to speak in English. He translated all these texts into English, and a very practical way of seeing um, how we work with ourselves. So. Does anyone else have a question? Uh, Sasha and I wanted to. <laughs> um, Trumpa Rupchev is really into um, doing dohas, that everyone uh, would go around the room and give one line, like a poem. And we thought um, that maybe if, if everyone went around the room, so whatever inspired them about John's talk tonight, we'd just give one line and then at the end we would read it. Wow. How brave is everybody here? The, um, the, what, what Rochelle is saying, the, in the, the tantric tradition, the, you know, tantric Buddhism, Vajrayana Buddhism, uh, there's a tradition called Doha. And Doha is songs, spontaneous songs. And teachers would compose these spontaneous songs and give their teachings in them. It, it, it was a long tradition of it. Um, the most famous, probably in the West, um, exponent of that tradition was Milarepa, who sang his teachings. And There's a book called The Hundred Thousand Songs of Milarepa. But there were many others, teachers, who did that as well. Talopa sang songs and Naropa, and a whole, whole bunch of, the, a lot of the siddhas uh, sang these doha. All right, you start. Yeah. This is a practice we used to do with him, by the way. Mm. Sit around with a group of students and he'd yeah. have us create Doha. 
Mm. It was excruciating. <laughs> when he, after a talk, he'd go back to his residence, wherever he was staying, whatever city, um, someone's apartment, and the cooks would have to come out of the kitchen, the servers, everyone would sit around, and everyone would participate, participate in the Dora, among other games that we played. Yeah, there were other games. Like the quality <coughs> games and things like that. Deceptions, deception just won't do. Let me accept that I'll do it. Maybe we'll get back. A person in hell may think a tongue looks like the devil. A person, a, a god person may think a tongue looks like a lily. But the tongue is just a tongue. <laughs> a person in the hell realm thinks a tongue looks like the devil. A person in the god realm thinks a tongue looks like a lily. What did I say? But a tongue is just a tongue. Okay, in the garden, looks like a lady. Do you want me to do it? Rochelle, so I am. Come on, one, one. Well, I've been seeing my room, and uh, so much treasures come together. There are many treasures. There are thieves in the room. There are many, so many, so much push the treasures. There are thieves in the room. I think we need the punctuation to go with this. Okay, <laughs> I'm I'm bad with that. <coughs> but there are so many treasures. Okay, we got it. Come on, get on. into a sated being. Oh. Nice. Sated. sated being. Sated. 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 Into a sated being. Nice. Sated. Sated. I don't even know what that word means. Looks satisfied. Oh. Oh, sated. Okay. Yeah. Okay, John. Um, the confusion and the beauty of the world break my heart. Oh. 
I breathe and feel to the right. Read it, the whole thing? Yes. <laughs> Deception just won't do. Let me accept that I do it. Around and around we go. A person in the hell room, a tongue looks like a devil. In the god room, looks like a lily. But a tongue is just a tongue. There are thieves in the room, but there are so many treasures. Come and get them. Break through dreams in order to live in reality. Awake from dreams. Belief, the illusion I will live without. Turn a hungry ghost into a sated being. The confusion and the beauty of the world break my heart. I breathe and feel tonight. So let's bow out. Oh, we're going to say the closing chant, right? Sorry. This is the dedication of merit. <coughs> it's called. This is traditional, and what it is is that um, we're dedicating the good that we have accumulated here tonight for the benefit of not only ourselves, but everybody in the world, other beings.